All right, welcome to another episode of Understanding Video Games, a public lecture on game studies. Today, chapter three, what is a game? The first half of the chapter, as it seemed a bit too long for me to put it all in one video. And I'm Benjamin. So today we will talk about what a game is. Let's have a look at the agenda. We'll talk today about general models for understanding games and later in the second part of this video about formal definitions, pragmatic definitions and the issue of genre. I'd like to start with uh, how the chapter itself starts, so with the following quote. Are poker and Assassin's Creed examples of the same phenomenon? The playing situation could hardly be more different. Poker is inherently multiplayer and is governed by abstract rules, not justified by any fictive world. A full house beats two pairs, aces are higher than jacks. Meanwhile, Assassin's Creed is a single-player, stealth-based fighting game that takes place in colorful historical settings, the rules of which mimic those of the physical world. So how is it possible that we would categorize both games, so poker and Assassin's Creed, as games, though they couldn't be more different from each other than anything else? We have this virtual setting where we play alone and engage and immerse into a historical setting where we fight and assassinate people while in the other game we um, play with a group of friends or colleagues or maybe strangers in a competition uh, at a table where we play with cards and chips sometimes uh, even for money. And this question is very important as it will guide us through this chapter because as in games research the question is about how we approach games and how do we analyze games, we need to ask essentially what a game actually is. Therefore, today we will talk about general models for understanding games. Um, and yeah, let's just dive into it. Understanding the way games work and how they differ from other types of entertainment helps us choose the appropriate methods to analyze video games. If we are not specific, we run the risk of using terminology and models inappropriate to our discussion. Or we risk blindness to the bias of our perspective. For instance, if we consider games to be stories, we will focus on rather different things than if we consider games to be drama or systems or types of play. The challenge here is not so much to find the correct perspective, but rather to be aware of and explicit about the assumptions we make. So what is being said here? In order for us to choose the appropriate methodology to analyze video games. So if you remember in the first chapter, we talked about um, how we study video games. It is important for us to understand what we mean when we use the term games or which specific games uh, we mean by that particular definition. Uh, as you will see in this lecture, there are various definitions of games and probably every scholar in the field of game studies has more or less their own kind of definition. However, as it said here at the end, we must be also aware uh, about the assumptions we make based on the definitions we choose to operate with. If we consider games to be first and foremost um, representations or narratives, we might miss the point of regarding the spatiality and the game design as a whole architecture, um, while at the same time, if we regard only the spatial game design or the conceptual game design, or maybe just the mechanics of the game, we lack the point that the game does actually represent something um, or has a narrative to tell. 
So let us start with some general models. We will approach this historically and start with what is being considered in this publication. So understanding games as the start of general models in games. And we begin with Ludwig Wittgenstein and the problem of games. Wittgenstein is a philosopher who um, was the student, if I remember right, of Bertrand Russell, one of the most influential philosophers of the early 20th century in analytic philosophy. Therefore, Ludwig Wittgenstein being also a strong representative of analytical philosophy. And uh, I think I, I'm pretty sure also considered the founder of the philosophy of language. Um, this will play an important role in a moment. And he wrote a book uh, or several works and in the uh, Tractatus um, uh, Philosophicus, I forgot the rest of the term. I read it. It was painful, but it was interesting. However, it is the philosophy of language. And I'd, I'm not sure if it's in this book or another pu publication, but he uses the term family resemblances to refer to um, games, to different types of games, which is also being then um, described within this chapter. And Wittgenstein says that we have we cannot know what games essentially are. We can only compare them to other games and find these so-called family resemblances. So we cannot tell what the game of chess or the game of tic-tac-toe is in itself, but we can say that it that these two games resemble each other, so they uh, intersect in some aspects, namely in the regards that they use um, squares as playing fields. Uh, both use them where um, action can be performed in chess, you can move your pieces within squares, and in tic-tac-toe you do your mark, whether the X or the circle, within one of these squares. So we cannot really tell or define what these games are, but we can compare other games with each other and find these family resemblances. Within the chapter, the authors of Understanding Video Games um, find the approach interesting, as you value it as a pioneering approach, but uh, highlight shortcomings of it, namely that it cannot be used for any form of analysis because uh, we cannot analyze the games if we fundamentally assume that there is no essential property of the game itself. Um, also Wittgenstein, as I mentioned earlier, was a philosopher of language and uh, referred mostly to the descriptions of the games and how games or play, so the terminology around these games, uh, uh, yeah, functioned within language, which is problematic, as we know today in game studies, as it is important to engage with the medium itself and gain insight by our interaction with games. If we refer only to um, descriptive aspects in language to games, we cannot really get an appropriate understanding of what these games mean. Ludwig Wittgenstein. Later on, we have the scholar Johann Hausinger and the magic circle theory that he outlines in his book Homo Ludens, a publication from the 1930s, a Dutch scholar, a historian, if I remember right, who then did his dissertation on um, play as an essential feature of um, society and human culture and groups. Games construct a magic circle which separates the game from the outside world. Playing a game, in this view, means setting oneself apart from the outside world and surrendering, surrendering to a system that has no effect on anything that lies beyond the circle. Now, this theory has been used for over 100, no, not over 100 years, for almost 100 years, and is still 
in some aspects valid, but has already been challenged and criticized. However, let's talk first about what the magic circle really is. As marked here, it uh, separates the game from the outside world. I have chosen this image of the um, football or soccer World Cup, where we see a stadium that is even in a kind of magic circle where we have then the soccer field. If we regard the game of football or soccer, depending from where you are on this planet, through the magic circle, um, we can see that the game of football operates according to certain rules. There is a distinct number of players and there is this distinct objective in the game. One has two teams that play against each other and they're only allowed to use their feet to, uh, in teamwork, shoot goals um, yeah, while confronting the enemy team. Violence is not permitted, though there is so-called gentleman's violence in football where you can slightly tackle or block someone. However, there are distinct rules in which these interactions can happen and in which ways the ball can be kicked by a player from one player to the other and to the, uh, into the goal. Now, this fundamentally exemplifies a magic circle because once we step out of the um, yeah, game field or the football field, we also leave these rules behind. Football players enter that field and operate under the rules of football, but once the game is over, they will act like anyone else. Uh, and these rules do not become valid in the outside world, right? So we can use a metro without kicking a ball. We can go to a party without focusing on scoring um, goals. Now, the point of this is to say that games are fundamentally enclo enclosures that function, that kind of form a own universe with, with its own laws that govern um, play and how a game is played. And once we step outside of these, um, these rules become non-valid because they're artificial. Now, this is a very interesting approach and still has some validity in regarding games, as it is true. If I play Call of Duty or Monopoly, there are only specific rules under which I can play these games, which are then not valid in my real uh, or in the quote unquote real world. Now, the problem with this notion is that today we know that these games do not just remain in their consecrated spots in their magic circles. Even after a football game, we see that the game leaves its field by agitating hooligans to fight uh, <laughs> among its, uh, each other and sometimes even do serious harm to, the, to themselves and others. Um, we see it with games uh, in, in cosplay events or conventions where people dress up as play characters. Um, we see it that when we still think about games while well, we have left the domain of the game itself, um, games can cause emotions within us. They can cause, they can circulate ideas. Just think about games like Deus Ex that are thematizing conspiracy theories and make you think deeper about how and how far the government is involved in our everyday um, world. So it is not very clear where to draw the boundaries here. And the magic circle is mostly rejected today as a, well, as, as, as a, as applying the magic circle as a methodology without doing adjustments. So nowadays the magic circle is more or less used as a point of reference or more or less as a lens to first spot the game and draw certain borders around it. We will see as later that scholars like um, Jasper Jewell 
thought that um, it is not necessarily um, a false theory of the magic circle, but it has been wrongly interpreted. So um, yeah, but we will get to that in a moment. So Johann Hausinger, the magic circle, considers games being an own world that once this realm is left behind all of these rules and everything that happened in these worlds become non-valid definitely an own discussion for itself now there were of course others um, following up with theories on play here we have roger calois from france on uh, who had a sociological approach to play and instead of um, categorizing a game as one form of activity, uh, Calois would analyze uh, or categorize different forms of games that corresponded to different kinds of human needs. Now, this classification is, um, has, has four kinds of games and operates in a scale. I will go through that now. So we have games that are Agon, which is competition, Alea, which is chance, Mimicry, which is imitation, and Illinx, which is vertigo. I hope I uh, spelled that right. So with, um, and each of these elements, each of these classifications corresponds to a fundamental playful need within us. So according to Roger Calois, we are, we are social animals, but we're also playful animals. And we have an intrinsic need for competition, experience chance or luck, imitation, so playing as if we were something else or representing something else, and vertigo, which is the... Uh, physical arousement or sen the sensation that our body can produce by certain activities and all of these um all of these human needs have been through the course of history tried to made uh, or, or rather operationalized into forms of games that are more or less uh, contain more or less loose rules that can be negotiated and very fixed rules. Those with loose rules are what he calls paideia, uh, and those with the more or less uh, rigid systems of rules is what is, is down the spectrum, which he calls ludus. And um, yeah, with this system, you can categorize certain games according to this classification. With competition, we could, as the previous example was football or soccer, so that we have competition. He refers that mostly sports are competitions, though um, that is not very accurate because we can also, we know that we can do sports without competing necessarily with other people. Then there's this other category on chance. The most closest to it is, is gambling. Gambling, uh, according to the archaeological record, is even older than sophisticated rule-based games themselves in form of divination. So shamans uh, um, throwing bones of birds to foretell the future and so on. Gambling is still around, as we can see. Um, if you think about Las Vegas, slot machines, loot boxes, and all alike. Uh, mimicry imitation uh, is basically what um, acting is, so theater, um, what we see in movies, but also role plays. Then we have vertigo, which is um, the bodily sensation that we get from certain activities, uh, like for example, um, running around <laughs> um, or doing that there is this game in the US that kids do or drunken uh, students that take a baseball bat, put their head on and then they turn around until they um, yeah, experience vertigo and then they need to run towards. 
interesting enough, the um, psychologist um, Mihai Chixin Mihai, uh, in his book on flow, states that the need for vertigo is one of the reasons why human beings take drugs or uh, um, conscious ex uh, expanding. Uh, or mind enhancing drugs to experience the sense of vertigo. And even though this um, system is not widely used today, uh, it remains interesting as all of these classifications are still very much uh, around. And I personally think that Kalwa was very right with calling these things needs that were then addressed by people who made games around that. So we still experience a lot of competition. Think about esports, think about the Olympics, uh, team sports and alike. There is still gambling around uh, with more and more gambling elements, even entering the traditional video game sphere and being already fixed part of it. If you think about loot boxes, um, mimicry and imitations, well, think about how much uh, mo that movies are still being consumed as something yeah, more, probably more than books or anything else around. So, uh, or even like theater, role play. So there still seems to be like this imitation game that people like to perform and vertigo. I think we all still, or some of us still enjoy the feeling of being on a roller coaster ride while others don't. As I said, uh, this system of Kalwa is not used by itself, but usually uh, still referred to as an important step to getting uh, to today's notions of game studies. However, it is difficult to analyze games only on basis of singular categories that Kalwa proposes, because games can be a lot of things. Think about FIFA, um, where we have yeah, pretty much except of vertigo everything. So we have uh, competition, we have chance. If you think about the loot boxes that are part of FIFA games nowadays, we have imitation. So we pretend that we are a team of other players or see ourselves and players in the game FIFA uh, Street. Uh, I think it was one of I think that is generally in FIFA anyway possible to create own characters, right? Where we can um, use them as avatars. And Vertigo, yeah, I think it's depending on how angry you get while losing. I'm a very bad FIFA player. Yeah, your blood flows and your blood pl uh, pressure increases, which can cause a sense of bodily sensation in a positive or maybe negative way. So, how do we analyze FIFA according to the system if it basically applies to everything? That being the uh, today's criticism of Roger Calois, um, yeah, classification of games. Then we have next on our list, Marshall McLuhan and games as cultural reflections. Games are popular art, collective social reactions to the main drive or action of any culture. Games like institutions are extensions of social man. Um, oh, I'm sorry. There is a repetition of um, this section. So uh, I'll just continue from here or let me just fix this very quick. So, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. let us just delete it. And there we go. Sorry for that hiccup, but that gives you maybe a bit more time to ponder on Roger Calois and his classification of games. So, games are popular art, collective social reactions to the main drive or action of any culture. Games like institutions are extensions of social man and of the body politic as technologies are extensions of the animal organism. Both games and technologies are counter irritants 
or ways of adjusting to the stress that occur in any social group. Games are dramatic models of our psychological lives, providing release of particular tensions. Uh, this quote is a direct quote of Marshall McLuhan, so it is not the authors of Understanding Games that write that, but Marshall McLuhan. And I think, if I remember right, this is a direct quote of his um, book, The Medium is the Message, from 1964. And here, Marshall McLuhan sees games as a reflection of our culture. So whatever, however games appear, they kind of mirror our society in an either abstract or even absurd way. So in understanding and analyzing games, we get a very intimate view on our culture itself. Games like institutions are extensions of social men and of the body politic as technologies are extensions of the animal organism. So not just as a mirror and reflection, these are even so-called extensions of us. They are part of our culture, they are part of our identity, and they are part of um, our overall experience living on this world whatever games have to say it is not just a, just an isolated game as a pastime but a fundamental reflection of ourselves of our culture and um cultural aspects just think about games from different countries that thematize different topics um and represent different things. I've used here Doom 1 as an example for, um, yeah, um, more or less the aspect of our nowadays Western techno capitalism. So the game is from the 90s, but curious enough, the first um, level or chapter in Doom is a map where you are in a computer where you collect um, uh, chips, computer chips to access uh, new uh, new stages of the level or new new rooms of the level and there you go around and shoot demons this is might seem like nonsensical violence but on the other hand especially in regards of how stressed or how what a, what a stressful environment the video games industry is I, every time I play the, this chapter of Doom, I get the feeling that the developers kind of represented their own kind of experience of developing games under um, harsh deadlines and working overtime all the time and fighting themselves with their inner demons, but also <laughs> external demons like the trials and tribulations of what it means to be a developer and each of these demons representing these problems. Well, yeah. The map represents basically the the very professional existence that these developers have, which are which is working with code, which is working with computers and um, yeah, programming and all alike. So um, in a way, Doom might be a re might be a representation for the stressful techno capitalism that we're in but at the same time and as it is said in the last part of this quote games are dramatic models of our psychological lives providing release of particular tensions uh, shooters can be seen and uh, i'm probably also one of these people who consider shooters to a certain degree as something very relaxing as something where you can literally blow off some steam though um, competitive gaming where you play against other players might make me more angry but playing doom or quake unreal tournament tournament serious sam or call of duty campaign is definitely something that allows me to blow off some steam or even um it's an it's a scene in house of cards where um the protagonist who is a politician is under constant pressure and then is a scene where he is at work and then the next scene is where he is playing call of duty and shooting other people uh in the game obviously um and it also represents this aspect of catharsis so the Ar aristotelian notion of catharsis that being uh, fictionally involved in drama and tension we get to project or um translate 
render our tension onto this virtual space, get rid of our stress. So uh, to get back to McLuhan, games are two things. They are an extension of us. They are already part of our human uh, metabolism, of our emotional metabolism as just another limb or organ part of us, and at the same time, a reflection of our own society. All right, and next on the list, we have Gregory Bateson and play as communication. And uh, Gregory Bateson is notorious for his term metacommunication. And metacommunication means communication about communication and refers to the wealth of cues we transmit and receive about how statements or actions should be interpreted. Perfect example would be irony. I can do, um, I can say something terrible like, uh, you know what, better, I'm not going to give an example as this is going to be uploaded on YouTube. So just imagine yourself about an ironic example of someone saying a statement that is totally over the top by, but by the um, pronunciation that person signals that this is more or less a joke or more or less um, not meant serious. And uh, with this point of view, we can also regard play as a form in which communication receives a form of metacommunication. I use this picture of two cats playing or fighting because I like cats and they are also uh, very interesting to observe in regards to this playful behavior or simply seeing that animals are playing so that play is not necessarily an anthropocentric notion or attribute. And these cats are playing or fighting and um, they're not really fighting. Both of them know that they are not really fighting, but they are playing. However, everything looks like they were fighting. And play, however, allows them to reach this, um, this, this framework or this commentary on the actual communicative act that renders fighting in that sense, not as fighting, but as playing. And which is also a form of communication itself. Obviously also something that humans do um, when they're teasing each other, um, but in some cases teasing, not in all cases, but in some cases teasing is actually part of um, liking someone or expressing affection. Um, just think about, uh, about games. If you invite someone to play a game with you, usually, or I would assume you enjoy spending time with that person. If you end up in, in a virtual um, server room in for League of Legends or somewhere else, you get randomized uh, and uh, uh, people you play with, you don't have an emotional connection to them. However, uh, if I'd invite you for a round of chess, that would be me expressing my interest to engage with you further and um, develop a relationship to you and maybe even challenge you. However, the act of playing with someone forms a different framework in communication where we could challenge each other or fight in a game, in a video game, eventually even kill each other virtually but it is framed in a playful way, in a different notion, similar as irony would do to certain statements that are totally over the top. Gregory Bateson and play as communication. Now we have Brian Sutton Smith and games as play. I'd like to also mention at this point that all of these scholars haven't engaged with video games themselves. This, uh, all of these scholars have engaged either with um, play, toys, or games, analog games like Monopoly here, for example. So let us see what Brian Sutton Smith has to tell about games as play. Rather, games emerge as societies mature and develop more advanced political and social organizations. 
games reflect the evolution of a society. The more complex a social system, the more advanced its games. Sutton Smith sees a game as finite, fixed, and goal-oriented. He defines games as an exercise of voluntary control systems in which there is an opposition between forces confined by a procedure and rules in order to produce a disequilibrial outcome. Very, very eloquent. So what does this mean? This means it goes very much in line with what we heard of uh, Marshall McLuhan, that in a way games reflect our society and the more complex it gets, the more complex these games become. Just think about the plethora um, of games we have nowadays, of the complexity of these games and video games, and I think it would be an understatement um, and definitely not an overstatement if I'd, I'd claim that our society is complex, or rather not complex. Make a lot of it whatever you want. But now what is problematic with this notion is that it kind of gives you the impression that um, cultures that haven't developed complex games such as Age of Empires or Call of Duty are somehow less developed. Um, I don't think that this is what Sutton Smith means, but it kind of is implied. And I uh, reject this as um, games games like Mancala, which is very much, um, st uh, which has been played in Africa over thousands of years and has even uh, ventured out of Africa, has received not an increase in variation over hundreds of years or thousands of years. And um, this game is in a way a completed process of game design. It's a game that has reached a, a well, a quote unquote perfect state where adding something to the game or taking something away would not do the game any good. So the game remained at its state. Look at chess. It went through a certain kind of transformations, and it, uh, in the late Middle Ages, chess remained in a state which has been become uh, generally accepted, and there is little variation uh, or development on chess, uh, at least on a major popular scale. And that not because because then you could claim that society hasn't developed since then. Obviously, what is here also meant is that games just become more complex because we have a lot of social play going around. This is also, or or, or ideal or ideal uh, ideal uh, ideologies become more complex. And um, Monopoly is a good example from the West, as it kind of represents capitalism and the way how we act in capitalism. And according to Brian Sutton Smith, this game is a it, it represents a state of our society where we'd, we developed games that more or less correspond to, the, to a certain degree of complexity that we have in our real society and um, that we can play and understand due to our, the complexity of our daily lives. So anything that would be less complex might be less engaging for us. Um, this is then again interesting. Uh, is interesting to look at from a pers from a psychological perspective of inducement of stimuli. So, if you think about it, our life has become so complicated and involved with entrenched with technology that we're constantly stimulated by things that analog games or very simple games might not provide the complexity or stimulus that we hope to get from more complex games. Though at the same time, this notion contradicts each other because it doesn't explain why games such as Fortnite that again have a way lesser complexity than games such as Hearts of Iron have re-emerged as more popular games uh, today. So um, problematic notion for sure, interesting to think about. Brian Sutton Smith and games as play. Here we have George Herbert Mead and role training 
famous sociologist and for me an individual can only obtain his unity of self when he has internalized this generalized other that is the attitude of the whole community games are excellent mirrors of the way that people organize themselves where all actions are related to each other in an organic way that can be understood by learning the rules children experiment with many different kinds of social organizations as they grow up the exercise of learning to belong of learning different roles and rules allows their personality to develop so here with mead we have games as instrumental to society to train us to fit into society to find our way into society become a normal functioning citizen in an overarching state or social group and uh, according to me games do this on two levels um, on one level by the ways how we learn so games are um, trial and uh, function under the um, thing uh, under the uh, principle of trial and error so you learn a game not just by reading its manual but trying it out and improving your play seeing how other people play uh, copying styles being inspired by other people so the learning process in games is usually or in many cases also a social activity uh, in which you learn certain rules um, in order to be accepted within the playful realm of a game so both of us need to have played chess before or know the rules so that we can agree on playing a game of chess without any contradictions however at the same time games do also represent our social order by the way it is structured and by the way how entities as Mead says, or as it is said, it says it said here, organically align with each other. I chose chess as an example, as chess remains in in container of the in, uh, cultural, um, I say, screenshot of the medieval uh, feudal system or the social order of the medieval period, where we have peasants and where we have uh, knights bishops and uh, kings and queens towers and each of these having different kinds of movement patterns that even represent to the importance of these figures they are given even different values so um uh taken a pawn of the others gives you one point while taken a uh, uh, a bishop gives you three points a tower or the, which also could represent a castle gives you i think five points and taking the queen gives you seven or eight points i'm not sure on this so the game does not just allow you to learn rules in the same fashion how you have to learn social rules to be a functioning member of society but it also already um, implies by its structure and representation an existing or um, back then existing or somehow still existing social order george herbert mead and role training uh, training here we get more into move slowly into the conventional game studies realm where we're talking about video games and not play and analog games with Henry Jenkins, also an important media scholar, media and communication scholar. Games represent a new lively art, one as appropriate for the digital age as those earlier media were for the machine age. They open up new aesthetic experiences and transform the computer screen into a realm of experimentation and innovation that is broadly accessible. Now, Henry Jenkins, in considering games as a new form of art, 
draws directly the compar comparison to the emergence of movies and the cinema in the early 20th century. They created new ways of telling stories, of experimenting with narrative and the visual arts, but also of the whole experience of engaging with something on screen. For Jenkins, video games are a new step in this progression of immersing ourselves into art and media and engaging with fiction, experimenting with it and having new forms of aesthetic, artful experiences. And so for Henry Jenkins, video games are not necessarily um, uh, sets of rules or formulated experience that um, act according to certain um, um, functions or operations that we as players agree to but video games but Henry Jenkins sees video games not necessarily as a succession of conventional board games for example but more as a succession of um, movies so experiencing visual media in a way that has been never done before, namely through interaction, through agency, through engaging with new environments in new ways of graphic styles. And uh, I've chosen here to exemplify this by the Shadow of, uh, Shadow of the Colossus, a game that was very innovative in its amazing landscapes that it rendered, the whole atmosphere that allowed you uh, that it, it created uh, going through this lands vast cape, marveling at this at this fantastic world, engaging with hu huge creatures, and yeah, what is still amazing was this atmosphere that this game allowed you to interact with. And Shadow of the Colossus is also a game where that is very very important for this aspect, where a lot of people not necessarily enjoyed progressing in the game itself, so defeating one boss after the other, but basically engaging with this virtual environment and exploring it without necessarily um, being in a hurry to, to progress in the game. So for Jenkins, games are, video games are first and foremost new ways to experience something or experience art and everything that we see today is our experimentations with what video games can do to involve to engage to immerse us into virtual worlds very interesting though the problematic aspect of that is being that it kind of um, ignores the aspect of mechanics of the game, of games still functioning according to certain rules and having certain objectives. Uh, it provides only one perspective, and I'd like to see, I personally, and I think also what the authors indicate in the book, um, see it as only part of the larger picture of the game. But not every scholar can capture the totality of what video games are. Therefore, the best way is to look at what specialists said with their certain backgrounds about games and then synthesize these views into your own kind of um, perspective towards games. And I think if I remember right, we are done with the first part. Um, we will continue with the second part where we will be talking about um, about formalis uh, formal definitions, pragmatic definitions, and the issue of genre later on, and then also um, review even this section, so this earlier section, with the usual discussion questions. So hope to see you in the second part of this chapter. <laughs>